Yeah, we're, we're, we're live. So thank you. Thank you, Heidi, for welcoming us. And good evening and welcome to everyone. And I should say good morning to some of you um, on the other side of the world. Um, my name is Father Brian Kromholtz. I'm the academic dean of the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. And it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to our Aquinas Lecture of 2021 and the, this lecture being given by Archbishop Anthony Fisher, joining us live from Sydney, Australia. To begin, our school's president, Father Peter Rogers, will offer a word, excuse me, a word of welcome and our opening prayer. Thank you, Father Brian. And welcome to all to our Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology annual Aquinas Lecture. Thomas Aquinas, a Dominican saint, was born in the year two. 1225 and died in 1274. So why do we name this important annual lecture after St. Thomas Aquinas? Well, St. Thomas's writings from the 13th century are the foundation of our academic formation for our Dominican student brothers and all our lay students at the DSBT. Aquinas holds the capacity of the human mind to understand reality. So he recognizes the importance of philosophy as the pursuit of wisdom, not only in itself, but also as a means for reaching deeper understanding in theology, using human reason as a tool for understanding revelation, which comes from the gospels and all the New Testament, philosophy and theology. This is why we are the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. Now let us begin with our opening prayer to begin this wonderful lecture. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. O God of wisdom, you gave your church, our brother St. Thomas Aquinas, a wise and holy teacher who sought truth. As we seek you, help us to seek the truth in our lives and to live that truth in our current society and culture. Bless our speaker and open our hearts to the insights we are able to gain to better live in these difficult times. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Brian, I now return the screen to you. Thank you, Father Peter. Before introducing our speaker, let me offer just a brief description of our time together this evening, this morning. We'll begin with a lecture, which should last from 45 to 60 minutes. And if you have questions for our speaker, please write them using the chat function and send them to everyone. Uh, that way everyone can see the questions being asked and can see, uh, you can see whether your question has been asked already. Um, I will collect the questions and I will attempt to group them or order them if there are too many uh, to, for a, a lot of time. In any case, I will then select questions and read them aloud for our speaker and for all of us. We will conclude after 90 minutes from our starting time. So that's at about 7 p.m. our time, noon in Sydney. If you have any technical questions, please direct them in the chat uh, function to Heidi McKenna. Now. Our lecturer received degrees in history and law from the University of Sydney before joining the Dominican order in 1985 and was ordained a priest in 1991. Since then, he has achieved a doctorate from Oxford, lectured at several universities, including the Australian Catholic University, the University of Notre Dame, Australia, and the John Paul II Institute in Melbourne, Australia, where he was founding director. In 2003, he was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of Sydney, where he had numerous, numerous responsibilities, including coordinator for World Youth Day of 2008. In 2010, he was appointed Bishop of Parramatta, and in 2014, Archbishop of Sydney. He currently serves as a member of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the Congregation for Oriental Churches, the Council of the Synod of Bishops, and since 2004 has been an ordinary member of the Pontifical Academy for Life, the body that advises the church on bioethics. 
In 2018, Archbishop Fisher participated in the Worldwide Synod of Bishops on Youth, Faith, and Vocational Discernment. He currently serves as Vice President of the Australian Bishops and Chair of the Bishops Commission for Catholic Education. Archbishop Fisher is Chancellor of the Catholic Institute of Sydney and a member of the Senate of the Australian Catholic University. He has published 10 books and over 100 academic articles, as well as 400 plus news, newspaper magazine articles on bioethics, moral theology, history, law, philosophy, and spirituality. In his Aquinas lecture, our speaker sets out to accomplish in a particular way one of the central aspects of the mission of our school, to bring the rich tradition of classical philosophy and Catholic theology, especially as exemplified by St. Thomas Aquinas, into engagement with contemporary scholarship and culture. His presentation is Loss of Trust and Crisis of Leadership, Responses with the Help of St. Thomas Aquinas. I am honored to present to you the 2021 DSBT Aquinas Lecturer, live from Sydney, Australia, the Most Reverend Anthony Fisher. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and hello to everyone from tomorrow, from Wednesday. Uh, my thanks to the President, Father Peter Rogers, and the Dean, Father Brian Cromholtz, to my dear friend, Father Hilary Martin, and all the faculty of the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology for inviting me to give this Aquinas lecture. I count it a great honor to join the list of great Dominican names from the SPT and GTU who've given this lecture in the past, as well as contributors from elsewhere. Our world is suffering from a bad case of trust deficit disorder. So said the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, as he opened the 2018 General Assembly of the United Nations, marking the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. People are feeling troubled and insecure. Trust is at a breaking point, he said. Trust in national institutions, trust among states. Trust in the rules-based global order. Within countries, people are losing faith in political establishments. Polarization is on the rise and populism is on the march. Among countries, cooperation is less certain and more difficult. World order is increasingly chaotic we face a set of paradoxes. The world is more connected, yet societies are becoming more fragmented. Challenges are growing outward, while many are turning inward. Many commentators have made similar observations. Just before COVID-19 hit, the annual Edelman Global Trust Barometer indicated that despite a strong global economy and high employment, most people in most countries surveyed distrusted government, corporations, NGOs, and media. After a year of pandemic, economic downturn, political instability, and worldwide protests over climate change, sexual violence, and systematic racism, the subsequent report revealed an epidemic of misinformation and widespread mistrust of institutions and leaders around the world. Trust in the Catholic Church has taken a severe beating in recent years.
especially in countries like our own that have faced a clergy child sexual abuse crisis. While most of the criminal behaviour and failures of leadership occurred 30 to 50 years ago, most of it was only spotlighted more recently. The damage to children and families was immense and heartbreaking. The faith of many people was shaken. Pastors were left demoralised and the credibility of the church seriously damaged. While much has now been done to bring justice and healing to survivors and to prevent recurrence of such things in the future, it may take generations for the necessary moral and structural conversion to be effected and for public confidence to be rebuilt. In the meantime, there is residual anger and distrust among many of the faithful and pastors, let alone amongst the media, governments and the general public. There are signs of a similar disappointment with political institutions throughout the democratic world. According to the World Values Survey, since the early 1980s, the proportion of people who distrust their government has grown from half to three quarters in the US and Britain and two thirds in France. The rise of populist and protest politics reflects voter disillusionment with the political establishment and a loss of economic and cultural power amongst particular regions or social classes. The unemployed, poorly paid, young or anxious about work have the least investment in the status quo. High profile cases of misuse of position have amplified the trope that all politicians are self-serving. Some politicians prey upon such disillusionment, sowing further seeds of doubt about democratic institutions. The media magnify the sense of powerlessness and exclusion. In recent years, many previously trusted institutions such as the UN, the European Union, the World Bank, the British Royal Family, the American Presidency, the Olympic and other sports organizations, and many corporations such as Lehman Brothers, Google, Facebook, Volkswagen, and Boeing have all been publicly shamed. Financial, legal, police, prison, military, tech, entertainment and media institutions have been subject to public scrutiny and many have been found wanting. A similar disenchantment has occurred with respect to experts, such as scientists, and health officials have encountered considerable resistance to COVID safety measures. Not only are journalists permanent skeptics themselves, but most people are skeptical about journalists. Many no longer feel safe on the streets. Conspiracy theories abound. Loneliness is rampant and judgmentalism, manufactured outrage and cancel culture thrive despite relativism. Some suggest that the whole social compact for which trust is a primary glue is coming unstuck. Even if this is overstated, there can be little doubt that distrust has been rising in recent years. Why declining trust matters. The effects of this global erosion of trust have been many. Francis Fukuyama of End of History fame observed that without a high degree of trust, complex modern societies struggle to sustain crucial institutions. In what Ross Douthat recently dubbed an era of decadence and disappointment, and others have called the culture of indignation, democracies have become deeply divided and increasingly dysfunctional, hostage to ideology, fear and anger, often resulting in short-sighted or extremist policies. Social divisions have worsened, opinions polarized, and many now view the world with suspicion. They then seek to shore up their position with walls of various sorts, loyalty groups, engineered consent, or spin. Bureaucracies and workplaces increasingly rely on compliance, audit, and fear of litigation 
in lieu of trust. And much of life, not just the news, is presumed fake. Religious faith, empirical science, history, all are undermined by radical distrust. Rational argument and expertise are devalued. Confidences and promises broken, candor doubted, and education increasingly fraught. Human relationships become ambiguous and insecure, and strangers treat each other with suspicion, disrespect, or hostility. In my specialist field of healthcare ethics, Edmund Pellegrino and Nora O'Neill argued persuasively that distrust imperils the therapeutic relationship. Beyond healthcare, many other professions and practices, for example, law and order, are much more difficult with so little trust about. In a low trust environment of individualistic post-liberalism, Common decency and self-confidence are also imperiled. It's difficult to maintain neighbourly relationships. In his article on trust, Hayden Ramsey gives an example. I stopped in front of a beautiful garden several doors from my own last spring. A woman was tending her plants behind a high fence. I said to her, your garden is so lovely, it cheers me up each day. The woman barely answered me. What did she fear? I had little power. She was safely inside. I'd attempted to give positive and friendly signs. I think she felt that I must be pretending friendship so that I could gain her trust. To cheat, to fraud or otherwise harm her. She believes she has good reason to expect me to be other than I appear to be. Why social relations are in this state is a tough question. Three, the related crisis of leadership. Given the importance of personal, institutional and societal trust for effective leadership and of good leadership for engendering and maintaining trust, it's unsurprising that a crisis of leadership would be observed at the same time as a deficit of trust. If most people distrust most institutions, they will especially distrust the leaders of those institutions. And that will affect both the quality and leadership and its reception. In many places, anger regarding clergy child sexual abuse is directed more at the hierarchy than the perpetrators. The woeful inaction of ordinaries in, is said to have enabled predators, made the vulnerable more so, and left victims without justice or healing. Critics say the bishops still don't get it, are only concerned to protect what is left of their assets and prestige or lack the imagination and will to fix things. I think this wrongly universalizes the failures or inadequacies of some and fails to get to the nub of what went so terribly wrong. While anger focused on church leaders has accelerated needed reforms, it has also diminished the credibility and morale of those who must lead such reforms. In some places, it's increasingly difficult to find new bishops, and I guess also new provincials. A recent example of the effects of damaged church leadership might be the confusion over the permissibility of the COVID-19 vaccines for Catholics, despite papal and curial clarifications, these are morally permissible, indeed strongly encouraged. Disillusionment with politicians as a class is also widespread, and this has contaminated attitudes to political parties, lobbyists, and backers. Civic leaders are thought to be drawn from a narrow gene pool, 
to be out of touch with the concerns of ordinary people, to overpromise and underdeliver, to engage in narrow identity politics, and to serve their own or powerful sectional interests. Some think the system so broken that even goodwill politicians will inevitably be corrupted or tamed, driven by the media and the electoral cycle. As in church and corporate leadership, this probably means some potentially excellent leaders are not putting their hands up for such roles. Beyond church and state, many institutions face a crisis of leadership. Spectacular failures of individual leaders and the perceived distance of leadership elites from ordinary people feed this negativity. Corporate leaders are widely perceived to put their own interests before their shareholders, their company's interests before their employees and customers, and short-term gains over long-term viability. This affects people's willingness to collaborate with them. Even if the crisis of leadership has been overhyped, it is obvious enough in many quarters. Four, philosophy, scripture and tradition on trust. What is this thing called trust that is in such dangerously short supply today? From the considerable literature on trust, we can conclude that trust is the reliance one party, the trustor, places upon another, the trustee, to provide something the trustor desires, love, truth, help. But unlike mere reliance, trust requires a certain attitude or beliefs that this help is assured, such that a failure would be experienced as a letdown, even a betrayal. A decline in trust means a decline in that reliance and or sense of assurance. Perhaps a decline from the trustor's point of view in the trustee's trustworthiness. Because trust is so important but also so risky, theorists have attended at length to what it is that makes trust warranted or assured. They've distinguished prudential or earned trust based on experience or qualifications, from instinctive or given trust, based on common humanity, authority or relationship, vertical trust, such as that between a citizen and leader, from horizontal trust between citizens, and spontaneous from reciprocal trust. The Bible and church teach, te church teaching repeatedly denounce trusting in idols. Nature, beauty, princes, armies, or money. We should entrust ourselves wholly to God, believe what he says, and practice those beliefs. The Psalter is full of such advice and offers several songs of trust. In his words and works, we see that God is constant, true and loving. To fail to trust in him is folly and self-defeating. Christ invites a filial trust in divine providence and mercy, prayerful and humble, relying not on our own strength, but on the grace of the Holy Spirit. This brings peace, confidence, and security, even in adversity. Though some die trusting in the Lord, trust in God is ultimately rewarded. Scripture and tradition also commend trust in people. God entrusts to humanity life, intellect, and freedom, stewardship of the earth, and many opportunities. Christ entrusts his word and sacraments to the church. To trust him is to trust those charged with preserving and transmitting his teachings. If human beings are to live in supportive communities, learn from each other, befriend and even marry each other, 
they must trust each other. Certain roles are offices of trust, but all the faithful should seek to be trustworthy, being God-fearing and neighbourly, keeping promises and confidences, eschewing lies and injustice. But we must be wary of trusting too much in ourselves and aware that all people are fallible and some untrustworthy. Some trust is reasonable trust, but so is some distrust. Which brings me to five, Aquinas on the what, whom and why of trust. Although Aquinas does not give trust the dedicated attention he gives, for instance, to prudence or truth, the idea appears throughout his corpus. It features in his exegetical and theological works as a quasi integral part of faith and hope. It also has implications for virtues such as truthfulness, prudence and docility, magnanimity, law and justice, prayerfulness and sacrifice, friendliness, courage and humility. In his treatment of testimony, for instance, Aquinas recognises that we regularly and reasonably accept on authority many things we think we know, and that this investment of trust is required both by faith and reason. Distrust, on the other hand, feeds vices such as presumption, detraction, greed, idolatry and irreligion, obstinacy, worldliness, pusillanimity, even gluttony. The great expositor of Aquinas on trust is Mari George of St. John's in Queens. She observes that when treating of faith and hope, Thomas uses the words initor and inherario, meaning to lean or rely upon, to fix upon or attach, to indicate the secure support one thing gives another. Elsewhere, he uses Fido, Credo, Habio Fiducium, and Fiducia in ways that approximate to the word trust as explicated above. In his disputed questions on hope, for instance, he observes, hope tends towards something good that is attainable and implies a certain confidence as to its attainment. Sometimes a man hopes to obtain something through his own power. Sometimes indeed, through the help of another whom he trusts will help. The impulse to hope necessarily has two aspects, namely in the good hoped for and the person trusted to help. Faith has the character of virtue insofar as it trusts in the testimony of the first truth, believing those things it reveals. Hope also has the character of virtue in that a man trusts in the divine assistance, even for attaining eternal life. In many places in his corpus, Thomas talks about our need to rely upon divine revelation, power, will, and mercy, upon the incarnation and the sacraments, not our own strength or worldly powers. Undermining trust in the scriptures, church or miracles, he thinks, will inevitably undermine Christian faith. God is not the only proper object of trust. In matters of faith and reason, theology and science, we assent to certain essential principles of speculative and practical reason rely upon the facts as they present themselves and trust those more experienced, prudent or enlightened than ourselves. We trust the prophets, evangelists, magisterium. We also rightly turn to the saints or ask other men for certain things, he says. And for this reason, some are blamed if they cannot be trusted to give help. 
Man is by nature a social animal, according to Aristotle. Anyone who cannot either lead the common life or is so self-sufficient as to not need to is either a beast or a god, he said. Aquinas echoes this view of our essential interconnectedness. And if we are social and political animals, we are trusting animals, bound together by language and customs and relying upon each other for many things. In his commentary on Boethius on the Trinity, Aquinas suggests, because in our common life, it is necessary for one man to rely upon another as if this other were himself with respect to those things which he cannot attain by himself. So too, it's necessary that he rely on those things which another knows and are unknown to himself. Thence it is that in human affairs, it's necessary that one man believe the things said by another. And this is the foundation of justice. For Thomas, the earthly good for human beings includes experiencing life, truth, beauty, and moral goodness, which often requires assistance from others. But our good also includes friendship itself with God, family, friends, the church, and the civil community. On this account, human beings must live in community with others to achieve their proper ends and out of love of neighbour, trusting one another and collaborating. In his commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics, Aquinas says a person owes trust and the sharing of things to his family and friends and similarly to his extended family, tribe, and fellow citizens. When trust is systematically broken down, as happens, for instance, in totalitarian regimes, relationships are tense and much of ordinary life is hazardous. Trust then is a social glue, the oil of smooth relationships. It's also a character trait. The virtuous person is both critically trusting and reasonably trustworthy. While some expectations are unreal or desperate and trust comes in degrees, we mostly expect others to help and we try to be helpful in turn. which brings me to six Aquinas on how to trust. How is it that we can trust? In what follows, I have reframed Murray George's reading of Aquinas on what makes trust assured. For Aquinas, there are three warrants for trust. First, disposition. As social animals, we naturally give each other the benefit of the doubt and expect others to be helpful. We trust taxi drivers not to give us philosophical formation, we have GTU for that, or psychological counselling, we have hair salons for that, but to get us safely where we want to go. But we've all had the experience of cab drivers taking us for a ride, an expensive one at that, in some foreign city. So a certain amount of distrust is justified. At the end of St. John's account of the cleansing of the temple, we're told that many believed in Jesus because of his miracles, but he did not trust himself to them. St. Thomas observes, for Christ, nothing was hidden of the things which are in a man. Knowing that they trusted him only imperfectly, Jesus did not trust himself to them. To be trustworthy, the trustee must be goodwilled, committed to truthfulness and common decency, generous, merciful and just, or at least sufficiently so to be ready to help. Thus, 
the trustor must be disposed to trust because of present need or desire for love, knowledge, help. And the trustee must be disposed to be trusted because of goodwill. That is, both must be ready for trust. Secondly, choice. We rely upon God because we know he most deeply cares for us. There's no such thing as too much trust in God as first truth and divine assistance. We also reasonably rely upon others. Sometimes they're complete strangers. More often they are people we know, family, friends, state officials, pastors, physicians, or work colleagues. The concept of neighbour, deriving from the parable of the Good Samaritan and foundational to Western ethical and legal notions of duty of care and negligence, is of someone upon whom we can reasonably rely. Someone who chooses, is willing, to make our concern theirs. Not to put too fine a point on it, they must actually give a damn. Some people are clearly more proximate, familiar or committed to us than others. We are more inclined to approach them and they are more inclined to make themselves accessible to us. Thus, the trustor must be familiar enough with the trustee to choose to rely upon them. And the trustee must choose to make the trustor's concern their own. Both must be willing for trust. Thirdly, competence. We assess someone's ability to help on the basis of their office, credentials or relationship to us, their past behaviour or reputation, whether they have the knowledge and capacity to provide what we seek. Of course, all human beings are fallible. Our judgments of their worth imperfect. And even those minded to help can prove unhelpful. This might be due to some character fault, as in criminals and those of ill repute. A defect of reason, as in the immature, insane or overly emotional. Internal bias or external manipulation. This possibility of failed trust makes the trustor vulnerable to disappointment. And the greater the need or depth of trust, the more vulnerable. As Annette Beyer pointed out in her classic essays on trust, we then feel not only disappointed, but really let down, even betrayed. Nonetheless, we sometimes choose to trust even a fairly limited or unreliable person. Thus, the trustor must be capable of enduring the vulnerability and opportunity that trust brings. And the trustee must be competent to satisfy the trustor's need or desire. Both must be able for trust. Having considered the nature and warrants of trust, the being ready, willing and able to trust, according to St Thomas, the three pressure points at which trust can fail, we can consider the implications for leadership. Which brings me to seven, Aquinas on trust and leadership. In his letter on kingship to the King of Cyprus and other texts, Aquinas offers thoughts on what good leadership of state, military, church and family involves the character required and roles of ordering, coordinating and protecting, the meaning of law and requirements of justice. The great contemporary expositor of Aquinas's law and politics is John Finnis of Oxford and Notre Dame. He points out that as part of his broad interest in human action, Aquinas considered the dispositions and principles proper to those with responsibility for a community. 
as well as the pros and cons of various political arrangements. I'll not review rival readings of Thomas's politics here today, but all agree he thought the well-being of individuals depends upon their being in place a well-led church and state, families and intermediate institutions. At the beginning of his commentary on Aristotle's ethics, Aquinas says that the purpose of a community is the flourishing of the members. And he elaborates there his crucial concept of the common good. Again, in the Summa Theologiae, he explains that the ultimate end of human life is happiness or beatitude. Since every part stands to the whole as incomplete stands to complete, and individual human beings are each parts of a complete community, law's appropriate concern is necessarily with directing towards common happiness that is, to the common good. In On Kingship, he expands upon this common good that leaders must advance. There are three requirements for the good life of a social group, he says. First, the society must be united in peace. Second, the members must be thus united, must be directed towards acting well. And third, the king must work to ensure that there is a sufficient supply of the necessities of living well. The exercise of state power is properly moderated by the following factors, according to Thomas. This overarching goal of promoting and defending the common good by rebuffing enemies, suppressing crime, making good laws, providing for genuine needs, promoting virtue. Secondly, other moral principles and norms of justice. Third, formal or customary constitutional provisions, for example, regarding succession, elections or appointments to office, terms, jurisdiction, and so on. And fourthly, proper respect for non-state institutions, especially church and family. Ecclesiastical power is curtailed in parallel ways and church leaders have additional responsibilities to advance the kingdom of God. There are various views on what form of government best achieves these goals and observes these constraints. Aquinas follows Aristotle in arguing that concentrated authorities are more likely to get things done than more diffuse governments. But the less confident we are about our leaders, the more we will want them to share out their power. Here, historical experience and societal trust play out in constitutional arrangements. Aquinas prefers a mixed model with one clear leader or monarch, preferably elected, who governs all, but who does so in concert with an aristocracy of high officials chosen for their excellence of character and aptitude, along with and for a democracy of many citizens entitled to vote and participate in the polity in other ways. Reflecting the mixed modes of government in the new orders of friars and emerging in the city-states, Aquinas thought such government, though less efficient, safer than the more monarchical styles in church and state till then. Or indeed, the more absolute monarchies and military models of religious life that were to appear in subsequent centuries. But in the end, someone must decide. Just as one king bee leads every hive, so Thomas thought, so a single leader is both more natural and more likely to unite people. Trust comes to play in many other points in this exposition of the ends and means of leadership. 
law is an ordinance of reason for the common good of a community promulgated by the one or ones responsible for looking after that community. It's thus a means of coordination through free cooperation and involves an implicit appeal to the mind and will of those it seeks to bind. When leaders put personal or sectional interests before those of the community or act in other ways that are unjust or ultra vires or dictate wrongful actions, they undermine respect for their institutions and for themselves and make themselves less like, make people less likely to collaborate with them. A good leader on Aquinas's account loves those she governs and accepts the role of leading them, is practically wise, just and focused on the common good, is magnanimous and humble, offering an elevating vision of a community of safe, virtuous and fulfilled people. Courageously perseveres with sound policy despite opposition, abides by proper limits to authority and appoints worthy people to offices, delegating or sharing governance appropriately, and leads by example, doing works that express greatness of soul and inspire the members. Which brings me to eight, addressing the trust and leadership crisis. So what might Aquinas say to our contemporary trust deficit and leadership crisis? Today, I want to suggest five points to be getting on with. First, I think Thomas would say there is no simple solution. Trust is a kind of social capital that takes a long while to build up. It can be torn down in short order. Disillusionment with religious and political leaders and with major institutions may take generations to be corrected. Christ's promise that the church will endure is no surety against decline in size or fervor at particular times or places. As for the survival of uh, the state and various institutions and professions, there are no guarantees at all. Secondly, we must be willing to trust others and follow our leaders. Aquinas would regard contemporary cynicism about institutions and authority as essentially a moral and spiritual problem requiring instruction and correction. With the scriptures and fathers, he would counsel Christians to reorder what they rely upon, carefully discerning who will best form and support them. They must play their own part in family, neighborhood, church, associations, city and nation. If growing inequality is a significant cause of people losing faith in the establishment, there must be serious efforts to address this and other causes of polarization and division. In that vein, several commentators have called for urgent action to rediscover relationships and rootedness, reduce tensions and promote civil debate and discourse in place of rancor, demonization and cancel culture. The detraction and vilification so common today must be called out for the vices St. Thomas identifies that they are. We might also explore in a fresh way unfashionable virtues like docility and obedience and promote genuine transformation of character rather than virtue signaling and a more communitarian ethic in place of atomistic individualism. Yuval Levin has recently argued that our 
Freedoms will depend upon such individual and institutional renewal and the consequent renewal of confidence in our leaders. Thirdly, some must lead, even in difficult times. Church, state and corporate leaders on Thomas's account must recognise that theirs is an office of trust and seek to deserve the trust of those they lead. Fundamental conversion of character and life may be required for leaders to be regarded as trustworthy. Leaders today are expected to demonstrate vision and creativity, efficiency and effectiveness, honesty and integrity, fairness and empathy, truthfulness and transparency. Of the last of these, St. Thomas says, Since a man is a social animal, each man naturally owes the other whatever is necessary for the preservation of human society. Now, it would be impossible for men to live together, live well together, unless they trusted one another to be telling each other the truth. Hence, the virtue of truthfulness, transparency, is something essential to a just society. Fourthly, leaders must address particular failings of their own institutions and consequent perceptions of untrustworthiness. For church leaders to regain credibility and popular confidence today will require apology and redress to victims of past failures, systemic change to ensure child safety and greater accountability and shared governance consonant with a Catholic ecclesiology and spirituality. After Simon Peter's triple betrayal came his triple or perfect act of contrition, his Pentecost inspiration and his unflinching fidelity to Christ and the mission thereafter. Today's church leaders must also seek holiness, humility after the recent humiliations, new life after the pruning, and asceticism, St. Thomas suggests, of relying not on the riches of their own position or eloquence, but on God's power alone. In dark times for the church, leaders may simply have to hold on faithfully and persevere. As Peter, as like Peter, they are led where they would rather not go. Likewise, in politics, leaders have much to do to regain people's trust. In accord with Thomas' thinking I've enunciated today, this may require much greater efforts by leaders to unite their community in peace, rather than dividing it for political purposes, to appeal to a broader base rather than a faction of a divided community to offer an inspiring vision with which people will willingly collaborate, to ensure systemic reform that will regain public confidence and to make again the public case for democracy and educate citizens on its nature and rationale. Groucho Marx famously said, the secret of life is honesty and fair dealing. If you can fake that, you've got it made. The corporate instinct in the face of the challenges I've identified today can be to seek PR assistance. Robert Phillips has argued, however, that business leaders can only regain the trust of shareholders, employees, customers and regulators by a deep change of attitude and behaviour. The emphasis must be on integrity, doing the right thing rather than compliance purpose before profit, governance of a high standard, and focus on the common good of each business and those it serves. Several scholars of corporate leadership have proposed old fashioned virtues like truthfulness, justice, and prudence 
as essential to restoring public confidence, rather than engaging in virtue signaling through corporate activism. Other institutions may also require radical change if they are to regain popular trust. And fifthly, while this lecture has focused on the erosion of trust and related crisis of leadership and what might be done about it, it must be recognised that there can be too much trust and too blind an obedience. In some situations, more distrust, scrutiny and resistance to authority are in order. To say we need to recover appropriate trust in institutions and each other and appropriate submission to good leaders is not the same as saying that we should naively trust everyone or follow every would-be leader, whatever they are proposing. Uh, which brings me to my conclusion. In his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis recently critiqued ideologies that breed mistrust, fomenting suspicion and resentment, especially towards strangers, and serving to marginalise them, or that promote an individualism that turns others into rivals rather than potential friends. Christian fraternity, solidarity and communion are a different path. The Hockey Party exhorts young people to trust in the spiritual and human riches inherited from past generations and to use the new technologies to share lives appropriately rather than indulge linguistic violence, deception or walling themselves up. Like Jesus and Aquinas, he proposes the Good Samaritan as our model here. And we rebuild neighbourhoods, polities, markets and international relations founded on trust rather than fear. Such newfound reliance on each other will require patience, forgiveness, mutual respect, deep listening and genuine dialogue. The Pope's call could not be more timely when so many commentators are identifying a radical erosion of trust, especially in major institutions and a related crisis of leadership, both of which play out in many negative ways in people's lives. In this lecture, I've sought to unpack the what, whom, why and how of trust with the help of St Thomas Aquinas especially his three warrants without which one party will not trust another, disposition, choice and competence. These must be the three starting points for any recovery of trust. I've also examined some of Aquinas's related thoughts on leadership and offered some proposals for addressing current challenges. Rebuilding trust in leaders will require those for whom they are responsible to be ready, willing and able to trust. And that those charged to lead be ready, willing and able to be trusted. That may require significant change on both sides. And for this, we must work and pray. In this era of contested realities and hermeneutics of suspicion, we might usefully hear again St. Thomas's syllogism of trust. That without which human society cannot be preserved is above all necessary, both for the individual and for the community. But without trust, human society cannot be sustained. For if men are to remain together, they must be able to believe each other's promises, testimony, and other things of this sort. Therefore, trust is in the highest degree necessary to humankind.
Amen. Thank you very much, Archbishop Fisher, for that uh, thoughtful and uh, well-considered treatment on trust. Um, and I trust that this has inspired our, our listeners uh, to, to think some more as they uh, begin to ask questions. I've received three questions in uh, the chat box so far. And I'll, I'll start by uh, reciting the one from our colleague at the Jesuit School of Theology here in Berkeley, uh, Professor Thomas Katoy. He asks, would you say that the trust we owe to religious institutions is intrinsically different from the trust we owe to political institutions? Or should it be different? Okay. Uh, well, thank you. I, I think, um, let me begin with what I think St. Thomas would say, uh, but we may have some things to add to that. Thomas, it seems to me in several places, seems to regard church and state as parallel in many ways, demanding our allegiance and our trust. Uh, and uh, we need to trust both. And if either of them interfere with the trust we properly have in the other, uh, that can be very bad for the polity or for the church. Uh, and uh, the reasons that we should trust either church or state are very similar reasons that he gives us. But there are differences too. So, for instance, uh, the, the political leader's responsibility, that for which we trust her or him, uh, is the common good of the polity. It's things like uh, making just laws, uh, leading people uh, in a limited way to virtue and so forth. But he says the, the church leader's responsibility is the much bigger and harder one of building the kingdom of God, of leading people to heaven, uh, of leading people to virtue in the fullest sense, much fuller than you'd, he'd ever ask of a civil leader. And, and so what we trust church leaders to do for us is a bigger and somewhat different thing, even if there are many parallels between the, 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 the trust we have in church and state um, on Thomas's account. Now, what might we add uh, in the 800 years since then? Obviously, we've gone a lot further in uh, the separation of church and state than he would have conceived of um, 800 years ago. Uh, we we uh, now see these as very much different departments of life with different goals, different high priests, different means to their goals. Uh, largely living and let live, let live rather than uh, overlapping. And where they overlap, we attempt some kind of collaboration uh, rather than, than rivalry. Uh, and I, I suppose Thomas, I suspect, would have asked bigger things of the church's role in the public life uh, and therefore for us to trust the church's role in the public life in a bigger way than probably we would today um, in, in, in our world. Uh, is that right? The way we've gone with, with liberalism and post-liberalism in terms of a, a much more limited role for church in, in society? Well, others here at this lecture might have some thoughts on that, but my, my sense is that the trying to push the church out of the public square in all sorts of ways to, to limit its voice, uh, to limit people bringing their, their faith uh, or faith-inspired values to the public square has been bad for the public square. It's been bad for the polity. Uh, and we've probably gone too far since the Enlightenment in the direction of, of limiting uh, the trust we have in the church uh, in our public good. Good. Thank you, Archbishop. Our, our, uh... This format doesn't allow for sort of seeing whether there's acknowledgement or anything, so we just kind of kind of move on here, uh, and we're starting to get more um, 
uh, uh, question. And uh, we did have an acknowledgement there from, uh, from Dr. Katoy. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna um, pick two of these because they, 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 they sound similar themes. Um, and, uh, and so I'll, I'll read first, first one, then the other. First is from Philip Ryan, um, who uh, asks, to what extent is trust conditioned on one, an individual's experience of racial discrimination, two, childhood experience, for example, a childhood spent in a dysfunctional family, or three, experience of failed leadership, either by the state or the church. So that's that's one question. A related question then from um, Father Anselm Ramelow uh, of our own school, a professor of philosophy uh, here. He says, the first school of trust would seem to be the family and it is broken. Children of divorce will have difficulty trusting even the remaining parents not to abandon them too. Abortion gives parents the right to kill their children. Mother Teresa thought that this undermines the most trusted relationships of all. And therefore, what is, what is left to me and you uh, to, to kill each other? Um, can trust in society be rebuilt without addressing these problems? So the, the one that you ask is, is more, more general, but with a, with a, with a threefold uh, uh, question about uh, experience of racial discrimination, child experience, and then experience of fail, failed leadership, and then uh, Professor Romulo's uh, question about trust in, at the family level and the, the, the mother-child relationship and the womb there. So, Well, thank you. Thank you both for your, your questions. Uh, I, I think that, that experiences such as experiencing uh, racism, possibly from the day you're born and to the day you die, and seeing it deeply entrenched uh, in your culture and institutions and therefore people's opportunities and uh, your childhood experiences. Uh, you now I've averted during this discussion to, uh, to child abuse, which is going to damage trust forever for many people. But even uh, less, less harmful childhood experiences are going to have their impact on trust. Uh, and and failed leadership that someone you trusted uh, to lead you has done so very badly. Uh, I, I think that these, these things play out uh, at both ends of trust. If we think of trust as a relationship between two individuals or two parties, uh, there's the whole area of trustworthiness. Do we think the other is worthy of our trust? And if we've experienced uh, hurtful ideologies and, and discrimination uh, or examples in our own uh, growing up or in the community around us, we will be much less likely to regard those who are held out to us as leaders uh, as trustworthy. We're going to be deeply sceptical and understandably so. At the other end of the equation, uh, uh, then there's the issue of if they are not trustworthy because of these different issues, are we going to be trust willing? Which I think trust willingness is a kind of flip side of trustworthiness. And of course, it's going to be very hard for us to trust if we're the victims in one way or another of those failures of, of leadership or those betrayals of trust. So the healing is going to have to be at both ends if the relationship of trust is to be healed. The person who should be deserving of trust is going to have to perform very much better to reassure uh, to, that, that uh, racism is not their thinking or their way, uh, that uh, but the hurt done in childhood uh, is to be healed and prevented from recurring, uh, that, that the failures of leadership will be admitted and, and in one way or another corrected. Only with those sorts of things will, the, will, will they be more trustworthy. And at the other end, a kind of conversion of, of to trust willingness that, that I'm not going to uh, allow myself to be so damaged by the ways I've been let down 
that I, I deny myself the opportunities to flourish. Uh, I become suspicious of all people. I become fearful of going outside. We need to rebuild trust willingness in ourselves and each other uh, if we're going to, to experience for the flourishing that a human being um, should have. So both of these are going to have to be healed if the relationship that is trust is to be healed. And I think the thought that the family is where a lot of this is must happen uh, is absolutely right. Uh, that, that if uh, families are exactly where we learn to trust, we do so absolutely instinctively uh, from the beginning. And then we have hopefully in a good family experience many confirmations of that instinct uh, by, by good actions, good causes to trust. The, the ready, willing and able stuff that I've talked about in today's talk. Uh, but of course, for many people, that's not the experience of family at all. It's quite the opposite. It's a place uh, of hurt or of dysfunction, uh, a place where they actually have to be on the alert and be sceptical rather than uh, be able to, to trust. Um, and if, if you don't learn trust there, then when you go to school, you're going to be able to trust your teachers. Uh, when you go to college, your lecturers... Uh, when you when you meet others that should be your friends, we be able to trust them. If right from childhood, the earliest childhood, you've actually been uh, taught distrust. Uh, it's how you heal that in an individual is is a huge question, but how as a society we make our families healthy, trustworthy places uh, is even is an even bigger question. And while ever we we just accept the disintegration of institutions like the family um, or the parish uh, or the school as places where people learn trust early in their life, the harder and harder it's going to be, I think, uh, for them to trust in the rest of their life. Well, thank you. Thank you for that uh, response. Uh, Archbishop, um, this one is from uh, a quick one from Alexander Ferrant. Uh, hello, Alex. Uh, if it is the case that the medium is the message, are Facebook and Twitter contrary to the common good with respect to undermining trust? Uh, at, at the end of my talk, I, I averted to uh, some of the thoughts of Pope Francis about the new media, and he's very skeptical. Indeed, he's sceptical about the old media. He doesn't even watch TV, uh, let alone use Facebook, although his people have persuaded him to have a Twitter account and they presumably write most of the tweets. Uh, but he's, he's very cautious. And why is he cautious? Because on places like Facebook, people indulge in a kind of linguistic violence, often uh, trolling and the rest, or, or deception. They create a false persona. They... They, they engage in, in fake news of all sorts, or they build a wall around themselves. And this is the particular uh, fear he has about the social media, that it actually gives us a, a way, an excuse, an addictive technology that means we can avoid actually meeting real people, uh, avoid intimacy. Uh, uh, it, it becomes a way of, of distancing ourselves from others. Now, of course... Does Facebook have to be that? Well, clearly not. Uh, we, we can use Facebook. I, I look at the way my mother uses Facebook as a surveillance tool on her grandchildren and her children. Uh, and for her, it's a great way of connecting, of seeing what they're up to, uh, of giving her a daily uh, uplift uh, and... and uh, in all sorts of ways during this time of COVID, we've found the new technologies such as Zoom, uh, a, a wonderful way of keeping us in contact and in, in healthy communication. Uh, so I don't think uh, Facebook and Instagram and some of the others 
have to be used in violent or deceptive or distancing ways, but it's a very real danger. I, I look at, I don't know if you call it road rage over there, but what we call road rage. Some people who are the nicest people you could meet, put them behind the wheel of a car and they become something very scary. Uh, well, the same can happen, I think, with the, the social media, that people are otherwise very courteous and civilised. Something happens when they get behind a computer screen and in the world of, of Facebook that is very unhealthy. Um, I, I know there's something to that. When you see someone's face, facial expressions, you, you, you tend to, uh, this changes the way you interact, but people, people, want, to, people want to hear you, not, not me. We'll, uh, we'll go to the next question here. Um, actually, we'll take two questions. Uh, um, one is from John, uh, John Toklas. Toklas. Um, so he's uh, saying, Your Grace, I have enjoyed your talk and thank you uh, uh, this morning as a lecturer of many undergraduate and Catholic leaders in pastoral care. Um, uh, he says, some students and or leaders are dissociated with their notion of a church yet want to or are working in a Catholic school. So how can one invoke this further role of trust in our church? Systemic reform and change of child safety, I agree, are important. Is there a need for stronger spiritual formation in our Catholic universities who are often called to secular governance? So that's one question. And another from uh, Diana Tamayor, uh, also asking similarly, how can I encourage my relatives who left the Catholic faith to come back when they don't believe in the integrity of the church and lost their trust in the Catholic church? So take that uh, combination. Thank, there. thank you. Uh, I think that the, uh, these are both huge questions for us at the moment. We know that in many of our Catholic institutions today, and we have, the Catholic Church has given the world so much in terms of social capital with institutions like uh, schools and universities, colleges, hospitals and aged care facilities, uh, social welfare uh, provision, and pastoral care provision. These are massive institutions where by far the biggest providers of all those things in the world, the Catholic Church. Uh, but of course, where do you find the people to do that work? Uh, and they're taken from the general community. Uh, hopefully some of them are uh, switched on Catholics. They really love the church and the mission of the church. But many of them come because of their own professional background and they're having at least some comfort with what the institution's up to. Uh, how, how, how do we make those ones who, who would not identify as Catholic, uh, who perhaps identify as ex-Catholic uh, or as ex-Christian, how do we make them more trusting um, of the institution? Uh, and, and therefore more, more fully committed to, to its mission. Um, and, and that's a really big challenge, I think, for, for uh, Catholic institutions, church institutions, at least in the, the Western secularising world. Uh, and, and it's one certainly I puzzle about. Uh, we have a massive Catholic school system here in Australia. How, how do we get the teachers who will really love uh, Jesus Christ and the gospel and, and his church and, and trust them. Uh, well, that has to happen at university where they're trained. It has to happen earlier in their life when they're at school. It has to happen in their own families uh, when they first the faith is first transmitted to them. If all of those are broken different ways, all those places, it's no wonder our teachers are sceptical or... Uh, not very committed. And the same would be true of our hospital workers, uh, our, our people in, in um, some of our social welfare agencies and so on. I think that the, the biggest ways we're going to regain people's trust um, after the various things that have damaged their trust uh, are going to be being true to the gospel of Jesus Christ to be really 
to really love it, to show the joy of it, to, to show how it really does make for the good life so that people will want a bit of that. They, they'll see there's something happening there that I want for, for myself and people I love. And I think hugely important in the re-evangelization of the culture and in regaining people's confidence is go, going to be the works of mercy. That when people see how these Christians love each other, as they said in the earliest days of the church, uh, that gains their trust much more than any kind of argument uh, or, or uh, uh, demand for trust. Uh, it's that they see there's something beautiful there that is that is good there that is worthy of my trust. On the second question, which overlaps uh, with how do we get people who have left have lost their trust in the church back to church, back to attending, back to loving the church, I think some of exactly the same uh, uh, remedies uh, are at work showing people the joy of, of, of the gospel uh, so they want some of that for themselves when they see what good it does for us um, and could do for them and showing them how these Christians love each other, uh, the gospel in action. Um, and, and those things drew the Roman Empire that was determined to kill Christianity to conversion, to becoming a Christian empire. Uh, it's done the same sort of thing in many a culture that we've come to as missionaries throughout history. Uh, I think we have to see our own culture as, as missionary territory in the same way. And that means many people who should be Catholic, who could be Catholic, who should be Christian, they've been baptised, they've had a Christian background, they've had Christian families, to see them as a mission field, of people that we need once again, to, 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 uh, to bring the gospel to lovingly and joyfully and to show the Christian life at its best. Well, Archbishop, I'm going to give you a challenge here, and that's to do with three questions, which, which will, which will um, uh, challenge you in your ability to make distinctions. So they, they, it looks like they want some Thomistic distinctions here. One is uh, Brother Michael Thomas, who says, it seems that there's a real connection between the rise in timidity or lack of courage and uh, a lack of trust in our society. How do you see the relation between these two characteristics? That's, that's one question. And then John Lauren asks uh, whether there's a difference between cynicism and distrust. Um, and finally, William Wiedersehen um, says, when trust has been broken between two parties, is it possible to be regained or should the trust between the parties be seen as being only replaced by a willingness to risk? So it's, there's a lot there, but... Um, okay, there sure is. <laughs> uh, St. Thomas does talk about the uh, importance of trust for courage uh, and in fact, it appears in, in his treatment of so many of the virtues somewhere along the line. Uh, but uh, he, he thinks that we, we will only uh, be able to be courageous if uh, we have hope. Uh, and so uh, we, we think that after whatever the hard thing is that we're going to endure, uh, that there's some good at the end of that. Uh, for which we'll, we'll, we'll take the risk, we'll endure the hardship, we'll persevere, we'll be patient and the rest. So uh, if we don't trust in that, if we don't uh, believe or have hope that there is something at the end of the tunnel, some light at the end of the tunnel, it's very hard to preserve courage. In fact, if we do, it might be foolhardiness rather than genuine courage because there's no... There's no rational reason uh, for, for our exercising courage there. Um, and, and timidity then, on his account, does include a failure of trust um, in, in, in that the good will ultimately win out, that, that God, divine providence will be at work in my life, that other people uh, might also uh, be part of supporting me well. 
There is a big difference, I think, between cynicism and distrust, though these uh, can overlap because, of course, uh, a great deal of distrust uh, can easily make a person cynical, but, but they're not the same. Uh, and I think that the question is right to, to, to invite that distinction. Uh, the, the cynic will be uh, a negative and untrusting whatever the evidence, uh, whatever the relationship, whoever the, the person is or the situation is that, that calls for trust. Uh, so the church leader, the political leader, whoever they are, cynical about them all um, and the institutions and the rest. The cynic, uh, in effect, is not making their judgment on the basis of the evidence, but of something uh, much deeper in their whole outlook and life. It may be due to some bad experiences, genuine ones in the past that, that's caused this. Distrust, on the other hand, as I've said, uh, can sometimes be quite warranted, can be quite rational. Uh, if, if someone has robbed you repeatedly, you should be careful dealing with them next time. If they've been violent towards others or towards you, you should be very cautious next time. Some distrust is not cynicism, it's actually the rational reaction to the evidence. Um, and, and so while we have to cultivate tr uh, a, a reasonable trust in ourselves, we also have to cultivate reasonable distrust. On the third question of can trust ever be regained or is the most we can hope for that people will, uh, I don't know, live and let live and accept a certain level of risk in life and take some risks and rely a bit on each other, but, but, but it's not really trust in the full sense. I'm, I'm optimistic that trust can be healed. I've seen that in, in relationships. I've seen that uh, at times in my own life, and I've seen that in communities that have been very damaged. Uh, uh, you look at the way communism damaged uh, relationships in the, uh, the Eastern Bloc in Europe so that no one trusted their neighbour. Everyone feared the other was a spy. Uh, you couldn't trust your own family that someone in, their, in your family wasn't spying on you. And, uh, well... Here we are 30 or 40 years later. I don't for, imagine, for a moment naively believe that's all been fixed, but I do think that people would report they trust their neighbours more than they did and their families more than they did. So, so I think some genuine healing of, of social situations or of individual relationships where, where there has been cause for, for distrust, uh, where 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 trustworthiness has not been experienced in the past, that can be healed and we can, we can rebuild trust. In the meantime, it may be that we have to, as the questioner suggested, just, just get along with life and rely a bit more, bit by bit, on each other. Archbishop, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, talk. And... Um, uh, we have a final question coming in here. Sounds like it seems like it's getting just under the wire. We could, maybe one more, Archbishop, and then and then we'll call it. Okay. Uh, how do we combat as a society the public challenge by the media of the worth of our political leaders behaving with their spiritual beliefs? So how do we com combat as a society the public challenge by the media of, of the worth of our political leaders behaving with their spiritual beliefs. Um, um, okay. I, I'm, I'm rereading that myself. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure what it's saying, but can I give you one reading? Because it could be an Aussie. Uh, <laughs> where our, our own prime minister recently openly declared himself, uh, as he has in fact on many occasions, he's outed himself as, an, as a Pentecostal Christian, who he says his political life is part of his Christian mission. And the media have really jumped on him. They think that's, you know, 
in a secular or secularizing world with separation of church and state, it's really bad for a politician to be so self-consciously a Christian. So that could be in the background of a question. I'm not sure. Um, look, I think that they're part of secularization uh, and particularly of a kind of a dogmatic uh, uh, secularism that, that is very potent in, in our cultures at the moment is to teach you, to, to insist to the society, you must not trust those guys. You must not trust church, family, uh, traditional wisdom, uh, so many things upon which uh, we built our lives because we felt, we felt those are the very people uh, in institutions to which a certain docility and obedience is natural and proper and from on whom we can rightly rely. The secular state, the secularizing of the culture have said, don't trust them. They're not worthy of your trust. Just trust government or just trust bureaucracy or just trust ideology. Uh, and, and I think that we Christians have to insist, no, uh, it actually is really good for democracy if people come in there uh, with a solid foundation in terms of faith and morals and that they're open about that so we all know as voters what it is that's driving them uh, and, and where they're coming from, their head and heart, uh, that these are not things we should be hiding as if they're some dirty little secret uh, or, or, or checking in at the, at the cloakroom before we enter the, the Congress building. Uh, no, we, we bring our faith and morals with us. It's part of what attracts uh, us, uh, the voters' attention to us. Uh, it's part of why they trust us. And, okay, the media is going to wag their fingers at this. There's going to be uh, people amongst certain political parties, the Greens and so on, who will say it's a terrible thing that there's a, a Christian leader um, let alone a Christian president or, or, in our case, prime minister. No, that's not a bad thing at all. They're wrong. It's, it's, it makes for better leadership that people have a clear foundation for their, for their action and that they're open about that to the rest of us. All right, thank you. I, I think that's, uh, we're, we're over time here. Uh, thank you so much, um, Archbishop Fisher, and I know that all of those um, joining us uh, also uh, appreciate uh, the wisdom you've shared with us and your willingness to, to take questions and to grapple with this, uh, these difficult uh, questions. And thank you very much. And, and I thank all of you who have joined us uh, today um, out there, um, spanning the globe, uh, uh, literally uh, on the other side of the earth um, for, for this time. And, um, and just, uh, uh, ask you to to uh, keep uh, keep us in your prayers as uh, as we keep you in ours, and uh, and thank you for helping us share our mission of bringing the light of truth to the world. And thank you, Archbishop Fisher. Our help. Is Brian, it's, it's, yeah, all right. Brian, could I just say to everybody, I wish I could be physically present with you all, and and you no, know, COVID COVID has done a lot of harm. Uh, and in terms of separating us from each other, but it's been a joy to be with you through this medium today. And I'm very grateful for having the, the opportunity. God bless you all. Absolutely. Thank you. God bless you. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth.